Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this discussion on elite capture and the corruption of security sectors. My name is Lise Grande, and I'm the head of the United States Institute of Peace. USIP is part of the U.S.'s national security infrastructure. It has specific capabilities that help parties to resolve their grievances before they lead to armed conflict. The Institute also engages with belligerents and security forces to reduce violence and protect civilians when conflicts do erupt, and USIP studies and shares options for terminating war and establishing stable security and governance arrangements. The Institute is strictly nonpartisan. We support congressional, foreign, and national security priorities, and we work across the U.S. agencies and departments to do this. One of the Institute's most important roles is to convene senior study groups of leaders and experts and practitioners to examine critical national security issues. Right now, USIP is facilitating 15 bipartisan study groups. These include groups that are looking at strategic stability in South Asia between the nuclear powers and groups focused on countering violent extremism in Afghanistan, Pakistan, and the Sahel. It's our great pleasure to be here today to discuss the report of one of USIP's most important study groups. This study group has been looking at the very vexing problem of why security cooperation and assistance does not have the kind of impact that we think and expect that it should. Like many other countries, the U.S. invests significantly in security cooperation and assistance. Although there are many cases where this assistance has worked well, what we're concerned about are the many more cases where it hasn't. USIP study group, which has been supported by USAID, has been looking at the reasons why. The study group was led by four distinguished co-chairs, U.S. Ambassadors Ann Patterson and Carl Eikenberry, Ambassador Don Labiri, and Ambassador Bill Taylor. We're joined this afternoon by two of the co-chairs, Ambassador Patterson, Ambassador Eikenberry. The group met for two years. It engaged with tens of security, political, and humanitarian experts, and the defense industry, civil society leaders, and academics were deeply involved in the discussions. The group had four case studies, one focused on Afghanistan, one on Uganda, one on Ukraine, and one on Mexico. And that in-depth case study helped to inform the conclusions that we're presenting to you today, and copies of the report we're pleased to say are here. The main finding of the study group is that many of the security sectors which we are trying to support are captured and corrupted by elites who are using these sectors for their own enrichment and political purposes. It follows from this that a key reason security cooperation and assistance are less effective than we want them to be is because not enough is being done to confront this corruption. The report itself is organized around four conceptual blocks and the four case studies I mentioned. The first section, it looks at the reasons why elites want to try and capture the security forces. The second section describes the mechanics of how elite capture and corruption actually work and manifest themselves on the ground. The third section analyzes the short, medium, and long-term consequences of elite capture. And the fourth, arguably the most important part of the report, includes 24 comprehensive recommendations on how to help detect, confront, roll back the malign influence of elites, and how to reduce the likelihood of future capture and corruption. If you allow me to present our two co-chairs who are with us today, Ambassador Patterson has been the U.S. Ambassador in El Salvador, Colombia, Pakistan, and Egypt, and Anne was the Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern and North African Affairs. She is the two-time recipient of the State Department's Distinguished Service Award, has served on two congressional commissions on Syria and the U.S. National Defense Strategy, and she was named one of the 100 top global thinkers in 2011.
General Lycanberry is a retired Lieutenant General in the U.S. Army and former ambassador to Afghanistan. He has commanded and served with mechanized light airborne and ranger infantry units in Hawaii, Korea, Italy, and served as the commander of the American Light Coalition in Afghanistan. He is the recipient of 11 military awards, four top awards from the Departments of State and Defense, and has been decorated by Canada and France. General Eikenberry is fluent in Mandarin and has a degree from Nanjing University in History. He is considered an expert on China. What we'd like to do today is to benefit from the extensive personal and professional knowledge that our two co-chairs have to reflect on the broad themes of the report, we recognize that the specifics of the four case studies are in the report itself. And if we can start with you, the report that you presided over builds on years of research and investigation. All of us who have worked in the field and worked in the security sectors have known for a very long time about elite capture and corruption. What the report refers to as the effectiveness gap between the amount we invest and the impact it actually has. Why hasn't more, since we've all known about the problem, been done to address it? Thank you very much, Lisa. And yes, we've known about this for a long time. So let me jump in on what I think are the reasons for this. One, in many of these countries where we provide assistance, we have conflicting objectives. Two, we do what we understand. Uh, we give equipment, we give training. We often don't understand the complex social and ethnic uh, identities that underline some of these institutions. But the most important factor, I think, in the last 20 years is security assistance and reform was subordinated to the war on terror. In every place I served, that was our overwhelming strategic objectives. And of course, countries understood this. So they began to, to basically play us in this respect. We had the specialized units. They would change their own legislation, uh, often to, to mask repressive techniques under the guise of counterterrorism. And the environment now has changed. We're involved in great power competition. We're involved with competition with China, which is an economic powerhouse. So our security structure has to be more efficient. We have to get more for our money. And our allies, particularly in the global south, need to deploy more quickly and be able to f defend themselves more effectively. So that requires a really hard look at security assistance, which I think this report has uh, contributed to quite substantially. General, when you were serving in Afghanistan, I know that you saw many of the problems that are described in the report. Why wasn't anything done to fix these? Yeah, you know, when I was in Afghanistan as the ambassador and was serving as the ambassador in Pakistan, so believe me, uh, some years ago over secured communications, we had this kind of uh, dialogue going on. But uh, to the point that we look at security assistance, but security assistance is taking place within a broader context of diplomacy and development. How does this fit in? And during the war on terror, what we had is, in many cases, a very difficult time of the U.S. departments and agencies aligning their efforts. So the CIA was argument was we wouldn't even be in this country if it wasn't for terrorism. That's what we're here for. That's the number one, two, and three priority. The military, their argument was, well, we're here trying to build security forces and until the shooting stops, nothing much more can be done. And then there's the embassy side or the ambassador side trying to pull together the development and the diplomacy. And they're arguing, well, we can su successfully kill the terrorist we can build security forces, but none of this is going to be lasting unless we have democratic institutions or accountable institutions that are politically sustainable. And the inability of in Washington, D.C. to try to then prioritize and resolve these contradictions was significant. Um, if you had a magic wand, General, and you could go back and change something in Afghanistan to do um, 
to redo security sector assistance, what would be the thing you would want to do? I think, I think there, Lise, uh, that, it, look, there's a lot that has to uh, be done here, and I think the report's been good, uh, uh, is been effective in identifying uh, different uh, things that must be done. One I, I would uh, particularly focus on is how do we develop the expertise that's going to be required to do long-term security assistance and the complexities uh, that when you go to a foreign country, if you don't speak the language, if you don't understand the culture, if you don't have a, uh, insights into the real politics, then the security assistance effort is not going to uh, succeed. So in the past, when the United States has gone into conflict, we'll have a period of uh, time where there's great interest and in, let's create a group of experts here. But then when the conflict is over, those, those experts will find that the opportunity costs that they paid for developing the language expertise, for uh, the skills, the repetitive assignments in that country, then they're lost at that point. So what you have to do is develop expertise, but not just for that particular conflict after the fact. You have to be anticipating and then to try to come up with uh, personnel systems so that those people then their, their careers are properly managed over the uh, course of 5, 10, 20 years. I'm talking about the military here, but I think, Anne, the, the same probably applies to state and development. Yeah, and it's very dramatic in state and the development agencies. And, and when you talk to people that served at high levels in Afghanistan, they point to this as the most critical issue. Mm -hmm. Short tours, eight months, no language capability, and people who aren't there long enough to be invested and who have the incentive to learn what's going on. And if you don't know what's going on on the ground, believe me, you make mistakes. I would argue that's why we do a lot better in Latin America. We can draw on huge numbers of legacy speakers. People mm. are there for years. Uh, mm. And they go around the area, and they have a good basis for comparison. Um, and the report that you and the general presided over came up with 24 recommendations. There's a lot in there. Of them, which are the ones that you think are the most urgent, the things that need to be done first? So the ones I think are the easiest, the most practical, because some of them involve longer-term analysis. One, transparency. We have legislation which requires transparency in foreign assistance, but mostly it's, it's honored only in the breach or it's incomprehensible. So we need to be transparent about what we're actually providing to these countries. That would help enormously, I think, because citizens in those countries could then see it and make judgments about it. And secondly, the recipient countries need mm -hmm. to be transparent. And just in two, two areas that, that I see all the time for our own DOD, one is in contracts and the value of contracts. DOD publishes that once a, once a day, practically, and the two is in promotions of high-level personnel in both the police and the military. So that, again, the citizens could see what was being, who was being promoted and who was in charge. And then as a slightly longer-term objective, which I, I think is a little more difficult, but certainly not impossible, is to train and empower citizens of the recipient country, think tanks, of which we have many represented here, think tanks, journalists and, and legislators who are invariably weak in these countries, teach them about defense budgeting mm -hmm. so they can ask intelligent questions and call their own systems, not to account, but at least do some serious analysis. We would welcome questions and observations from colleagues who are joining us today. And since I know Philippe, I'm going to ask him to jump in first. So thanks for <clears throat> thanks for joining us. Um, the The question I would have would draw us back to uh, some of the incentives that the report seems to be listing um, for elite capture. And one of the incentive is to coup proof to use the security sector to protect yourself against uh, coup proof. So I would ask Ambassador Patterson or Eikenberry if, from their experience, they've seen examples uh, in the countries where they operate it, where the security sectors are being used in order to protect uh, regimes from, uh, from coup d'etat, or uh, I'd be interested in, 
in, in your reflections on that specific incentive for elite capture that the report seems to identify? Well, if, if I can start, um, it's, it's very context specific when you talk about then elites in a country trying to coup proof and they can go about that in many different ways. You know, a starting point is if you're an autocrat, you look at your security forces very differently than you will in a consolidated democracy. Mm -hmm. so those, <clears throat> those security forces, uh, they've got guns and that can end your rule, which you don't want to give up. So yeah, they, they look at those forces in a quite different way. And then how do they ensure the coup proofing? Um, one is to create a dysfunctional security apparatus. So I'll create a National Guard force that uh, has guns and reports directly to me and a police force that's separate reporting directly to me and I'll create a very strong intelligence system that's reporting directly to me, uh, my main military force, that's one. And we see that in many countries. Another is just to uh, use your security forces then, who's got the guns, and make sure that they're very happy through, uh, through then the patronage that you're giving them. We have certain countries that have taken their security forces and they're heavily involved in the economy. And they're heavily involved in the economy because that's the patronage and they stay loyal to the uh, leader. So uh, many different uh, forms of this and to get to the point then, what do you do about it? Uh, it requires, I think, an a, a education program and a focus uh, with your people that are conducting security assistance reform and security assistance programs where they're not just looking at the tactical capability of the particular unit that they're working with, but they're opening up the aperture wide and there's thinking then beyond tactical capability development. What are the underlying institutions then that exist in that country that are going to be critical then for ensuring that these military forces are acting responsibly and in an accountable manner? Other questions and reflections? Sir. Uh, th thanks for your topic, for your research. My name is Andrei Buzarov. I am from Ukraine. I'm an international uh, journalist and PhD researcher. <coughs> the question of elite, I also uh, has a PhD on social philosophy and philosophy of history. And the problems of elites, it's a very, very actual problem for Ukraine, you know, because after the collapse of the Soviet Union, we have some elite, which was ex-Soviet, but became pro-democratic, uh, pro, pro, pro anti-Soviet. The war, the first war, eight years ago, and the second war, uh, last year, accelerated the process of construction of new elites in Ukraine. So uh, one of the biggest challenges for Ukrainian society that still I don't have as a Ukrainian citizen, answer what will be next Ukrainian elite. So we, we had the post-Soviet, now we see that oligarchs and the others, they, some of them, they fled of Ukraine. So who can be in accordance with your, with your experience, Afghanistan, because you saw the pre-war, during the war, and post-war societies. So what can be the base for the construction uh, of elite in Ukraine in these five years, 10 years, I don't know. Thank you. Um, perhaps <clears throat> two points about, uh, two points about um, the war right now between Russia and Ukraine and to get onto this topic of security assistance. Uh, the first is perhaps not directly related to security assistance, but uh, is an important insight into the performance of the Ukrainian armed forces right now. So with the security assistance programs that NATO, United States, European countries had going back to 2014, one of the big successes that took place that was not known at the time uh, until the war began is an effort to change the professional military culture in the Ukrainian armed forces, which had the Soviet legacy, as I understood it, a very top-down command approach, and then a development of a new command approach, which was very bottoms up. So delegating authorities to junior leaders, letting them take the initiative. And uh, that led to a dramatic improvement 
in the Ukrainian Armed Forces, as I understand it, and perhaps also then importantly then made that an armed forces, which was much more an armed forces of the people than the elite. The second question, though, the, the second uh, insight I'd offer here is that um, Ukraine right now is at war, uh, you know, heroic actions, uh, deprivation by the people. But as we're talking about security assistance and this question of elite capture, very importantly, as Ukraine moves forward, and importantly for the donor, uh, the donor countries, is that these questions we're talking about with the elite capture are moved front and center. Because you could win the war if, there's a, if, if that war can be won. But then there's the question of the day after. And uh, with Ukraine, will it be a consolidated democracy? at that point. So what's going on right now, you're under duress, but these questions though about accountability and transparency, they will greatly matter. Ma'am. Thank you. Uh, I'm Greta Fenner with the Basel Institute on Governance, so I'm the, in the anti-corruption field. Um, and I'd be curious, so this is about elite capture in the security sectors. Did you see significant amounts of intersections with the elite capture of other sectors? Because we would today say states are captured full stop. And they, they, you know, we wouldn't sort of look at it. It's very, very relevant what you did. I didn't want to. But did you see intersections? Or did you just see this as a system that captures the security sector and every other sector? Was there anything specific that you would identify there? So I saw a lot of collusion in this. Uh, elite capture between civilian sectors and, and security sectors. And it's because some of this is the fault of the United States and other donors because they go to the same people and empower them on grounds of familiarity or effectiveness, so, so put that aside. But yes, there's a lot of, because they learn, they learn because they're not stupid, they learn how to cooperate with each other and maximize their influence. I don't actually think corruption is, is the primary driver of elite capture. I think it's super important. But the more important one is holding on to political power. And, and it's great to have money and funnel resources to your friends. But you funnel resources to your friends who can help you retain power. Because let's be honest, in many of these countries, losing power has lethal implications, too. So there's an enormous incentive to strengthen your position. So yes, I've seen that in a number of countries. Can I respond on Ukraine? One thing I saw in Latin America, and both in El Salvador and Colombia, the role of the international community, I know this sounds trite, is going to be hugely important. I can't tell you how important a very, very effective UN leadership was in El Salvador that was seen as an honest broker that had a large enough staff to intervene in disputes among parties. And by God, I hope the UN's working on that now. If Sir. I could also on this question of different sectors than within a country and how does that uh, work with elite capture. I think that you have to have a very, whole, my own experience, a holistic view as you look at uh, security sector reform. So for instance, you can find in certain cases where the elite then are turning to the judicial sector and they find a way to hollow that out. And so even as you're focusing hard on the security forces, the back door is getting open here. Involvement in the economy, a back door is open there. And uh, it's, uh, it's something that without that uh, whole approach, you're not going to solve right. these problems. You might want to add Sudan to your case study. Because it's perfect to illustrate that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's just Sir. It goes on when I speak. Hi, I'm Andrew Solinger with Foreign Policy Magazine. Excellent report, I look forward to reviewing. And I was just looking at your recommendations and thinking, you know, we don't operate in a vacuum, unfortunately. And there are other uh, players who foster and um, accelerate elite capture in countries where we may not be able to have the time to act um, with um, care and transparency. Um, and um, I'm thinking of some African nations, the DRC, et cetera. And I'm just kind of curious how you view that 
um, competitive element when you have you know Wagner groups and the like um, tr uh, trolling the world, intervening, and really the, are, are probably the, the worst players in this space. But we don't. We, we, is, how, how much time can we take to uh, uh, take that care to follow these recommendations in some of these um, regions, you know, Sudan uh, included? So, so Ron Newman says in the Afghanistan portion that this was a huge dilemma because you've got to move, you've got to, first you don't have the personnel who knows the ground, but you, you're under pressure to move enormously quick to get it done, and that's also been my experience. There's, when you have a conflict, you've got to get in there and, and no one wants to hear any questions. Yes, you have to get in there, you have to be competitive, but you have to be mindful that at the same time you, it, you can look at these other issues in parallel with moving quickly. And that's what our bureaucracy is very ill-suited to do right now. Um, but we have many African experts who can do this, even while you're moving ahead with security assistance, with counterterrorism, with all sorts of lethal assistance that, that needs to be delivered. In preparing for today's session, we were having a, a discussion about one of the recommendations um, which relates to staying there for a long time, playing the long game, and recognizing that U.S. adversaries are also playing that game. And if we go for short-term solutions, we risk, in the end, losing out on our key aims because we are done and out and focused somewhere else. When we were talking about how to, we actually thought someone was going to ask us this question. So when we were talking about how to respond to this, <laughs> we were looking at um, what are the, the risks of a short-term intervention versus what the risks are for trying to mobilize the political support and resources that are necessary for playing that long game. Um, since Anne's already answered part of the question, General, did you want to come in and share some of that? Yeah, so, you know, getting back to uh, what Anne had uh, talked about with this uh, so-called war on terror over a 15-year period, during that period of time, uh, we were not focused on China, we were not focused on Russia, so now we talk about the return of great power competition. Will this have an impact then on how the United States look at its security assistance? I think it will. Uh, that now, as we look at different parts of the world, it's going to be through the prism of great power competition. So that means that certain countries in the world, based upon where they are geographically, is it important for lines of communication, sea lines of communication? What kind of resources do they have? What kind of access? Now, that's a very, uh, that's uh, not a uh, strong argument if we're saying that uh, what we should be doing everywhere in the world is advancing democratic values. But I think that uh, it's quite clear that based upon our experience of the first 15 years of this century, that there's a limit to what we can do. And so uh, people say, well, security assistance has worked. Look at uh, Korea as an example long ago, but that was within the context of the Cold War. And what that gave then for the United States at that point in time was staying power. And that uh, the DRC remains such a tragic country but there still is no compelling real politic argument about why should the United States have a big security assistance effort in the DRC. Are there other parts of the world right now which are, are crying out for political stability, which over the next five to 10 years, as we talk about global competition, will lead the United States and partners to say that's a very important country and that uh, we need to move forward with smart security assistance programs for reasons of competition, or we just can't allow that to fail. But we're going to look at the world in, uh, differently in different locations. Some will draw our interest and others uh, will not. Other observations and comments? Actually, just, just on that last point, when you know some countries would draw your attention and you will go in and provide security assistance and hopefully you know, also counter elite capture. In other countries, I'm not saying the United States only, but for example, the United States has such vested geopolitical interests itself 
that there is a risk that we accommodate for elite capture because we cannot risk that that country destabilizes. And I think that's also, in my view, something that we've seen happen over and over again, possibly. I'm not an expert in this field, but ultimately, certainly some countries just cannot fail and we accept a lot from them in terms of elite capture as long as they are aligned with us. And that also undermines fundamentally, and I think that's what we've seen in Eastern Europe as well, undermines ultimately the global uh, geopolitical security framework, I would argue. And I don't know how I would do it better, of course, but uh, I think that's a point we also can't neglect, yeah. So, so I, think, I think that's right. Uh, the, and, and again, it was quite dramatic during the war on terror that you get a full pass. <laughs> If you're a, if you're a friendly on the war on terror, but but it doesn't have to be that way. I mean, we certainly have the knowledge and the expertise, and that's the purpose of this report is to sort of open the discussion on this. That you can still have countries that are too big to fail or on the brink or for all sorts of reasons that we have to support them, and still work with elements in that society because that's also where we tend to sort of give it a pass to do a better job of monitoring their own systems. It's not impossible, it's just hard, and our system is not directed that way. That's what we're trying to promote here. Ma'am. Yes, Viola von Kremen from the European Parliament, um, and I'm working in Eastern Europe in particular, but also working on anti-corruption. and. I have to admit, I have not read your study yet, but I will do very soon. Uh, I was uh, always puzzled because many of our countries are a tax haven um, for, for, for everything, money laundering. We, we're having all these enablers who help those uh, elite uh, who are uh, keeping their, their countries hostages and so on. I, think that could not be, maybe it isn't uh, the part of your uh, of your study, but I mean, what kind of recommendations would you give in particular to those countries where we have many uh, of them in the European Union to go much harder uh, against those who actually, yeah, enable uh, the structures of, uh, of yeah, elite capture in, in, in some of the least development countries? It's so the U.S. government's done a lot of recent years to crack down on enablers. And here's what I'd say, and that this is the most honest reply I can give you. It is very ad hoc. It's whack-a-mole. It doesn't get at the underlying issues of institutionality. It doesn't go after the, the, the corruption within the society. It just gets at individuals. And believe me, if you take one off the field, another one is behind him. Uh, so that's why I think we need to focus on institutionalization, better laws, better banking laws, more control of the central bank, et cetera. But, but at least in the individuals, I think you would find uh, that the U.S. government, mostly through visa restrictions, has, has done a more comprehensive job. But it's not the answer, in my view. One of the most interesting parts of the report is, and it's based on the case studies, is where we look deeply at how corrupt practices on the ground actually manifest themselves. And I know that as co-chairs, you watch that section particularly. Of the myriad ways that elites manipulate systems for their own benefit, which do you think tactically are the most difficult for us and our allies to address? Well, I, I think, Lee's uh, one would be that the more that uh, what has got the United States interest in a particular country um, where there might be a threat that's emanating from that country possibly for transnational terrorism, that uh, then you've got a principal agent problem or you've got the problem of moral hazard, that uh, the leadership, the uh, president of the United States then as he's looking at the relationship with that uh, particular country, uh, he's continually thinking about the threat that that country could pose. So these trade-offs that we've been talking about then, that, well, let's play the long game, let's uh, build institutions, there's a tension right. that goes uh, with that. And uh, I've certainly experienced that tension as the ambassador to Afghanistan, where I'd be making arguments then for questions of transparency and accountability, but 
uh, given the uh, nature of the uh, threat that was there, bin Laden had not been found yet, that that's going to be subordinated. So that's important. And I think what the report is, uh, does effectively in arguing is taking that problem up front and then saying, how can you frame this in different ways that you do see the importance of the transparency, but still you're trying to uh, manage some very difficult uh, problems and trade-offs. The second would be where I think it gets to be uh, difficult to uh, root this out is when the security forces get heavily involved in the economy. So we've seen that in uh, cases like uh, Egypt, uh, other countries uh, that we could uh, name. And when that occurs, then it, uh, as, you're, as you're trying to then shine a light on the security forces and try to get uh, accountability, you're finding that they're everywhere and they've got uh, the ability to undermine your efforts. And what did you think were some of the most difficult? I think the most difficult we have in this is, is being aware of the ethnic and tribal uh, dynamics of this in many countries because it's something so alien to the West. And the next thing I think is, is basically what Carl is saying is, is the military structure because not only are these institutions often corrupt and integrated into the economy, they become unstable themselves because, because the cronies are favored with promotions and with money and with uh, post-retirement jobs. And that makes, and this makes them, means young leaders, promising leaders can't rise to the top. It means that uh, security forces won't innovate and they're stuck in the past. It has lots of pernicious effects on the institution itself. But one of the worst is the institution becomes unstable because lower ranking people want to get their top at the, want to get their crack at the, at the rewards. So it's, it's always in a state of distrust and flux. And the, you know, the, the kind of uh, programs that the, the, our government in Washington then that uh, they'll legislate uh, with best of intentions and they will then uh, have these different kinds of development programs or military programs that become legislation and they go and they stream into a U.S. embassy abroad. So the host country then as they look at where the money is coming from Washington, D.C., they get to be very, very adept in presenting their case about why that money stream is something that should be coming their way. I'll give you an example. So in Nigeria, when I visited there several years ago, and I talked to our country team at that time, the, uh, the different uh, embassy offices, and it was Boko Haram, Boko Haram, Boko Haram. And there was a question on my part, yes, that's, that's important for Nigeria, but they've got a lot of problems right now with security. And so afterwards, and I talked to uh, several of the leaders separately after the meeting and said, you know, it, it was interesting. We didn't talk about all these other problems. Say, yes, but where we can get money from Washington, D.C. is if we talk about Boko Haram. That's countering violent extremism. Best of intentions with that, uh, with that embassy team. Best of intentions, of course. Get more resources and see how they can be used. But that also, uh, to get at these, uh, these problems that exist, then that Washington, they've got uh, money for countering violent extremism, for terrorism programs, but that might not be what is uh, absolutely needed to holistically affect the problems that are afflicting that country. We're coming toward the end of the session. May we ask if there are other questions from the, the colleagues? A final question, um, General Ambassador. There's an argument that the problems we're facing in security cooperation and assistance are so embedded, so intractable, that we should scrap the whole effort and start again. How would you respond to that? Well. The United States now is facing a very different world than we faced 25 years ago. We, uh, there was an, uh, 
the end of the Cold War proved, I think, is going to prove in the greater course of history an anomaly. So we had this period of time in the 1990s, maybe for the first decade of this century, a period where it's overstated that uh, the United States was a uh, the, uh, the only superpower, unipolar, but certainly militarily, we were at that uh, period of time. Now we have got uh, competition uh, from China, competition from Russia. We see that uh, now different regions of the world are starting to move on their own with uh, major powers within particular regions. And all the while, the United States now, our ability to try to maintain military presence everywhere in the world, we cannot. So if we want to say, well, security assistance then uh, will, should just go away, we'd have to reinvent it. Because our ability then to try to provide stability to certain parts of the world to compete effectively is going to be very dependent upon tools of security assistance. And I'd say that uh, what this report is talking about then, Lee's, you know, ways to uh, look at security assistance, it's something that we have to take uh, seriously. Mm -hmm. Because if we walk away from this and think that if we lock our doors uh, shut, that we don't have to worry about what's in the, going on in the front yard at night or the backyard, we're going to be, uh, we're going to be shaken by that. Ambassador. Uh, first, let me say that there are countries where security assistance has been very effective, and we need to realize, understand why that was. But secondly, I totally agree. The United States is a global power, and we're in a, we're in a very important shift right now in our, in our presence in the world, and we're going to be unable, again, to project power in the way that we used to project power, so countries have to do it for themselves. And that's why I think this report is actually very well-timed, because it's a way of thinking about security assistance differently than we thought about in the past. And it can be transformed if people will pay attention to it. There was no need to really pay attention to this for a long time, to tell you the truth. It was sort of on autopilot in the administration and the Congress, and everyone went through their, frankly, rote performance year after year. But that's changed, and I think the report and, and frankly, the general discussion of America's strategic interests have made that very timely. General, Ambassador, thank you. Before we conclude, we would like to recognize the role that Philippe LaRue Martin and Caleb Trenkoff Fairmont played. They're the team leader and senior expert in USIP's unit that works on security governance. The report would not have been possible without their dedication and leadership. Gentlemen, thank you. Thank you all for being with us. We have copies of the report here, and it's also available at usip.org. Good afternoon.